I'm going to invite you to go ahead and take a seat and turn in your Bibles or on your Bible apps to Psalm 78. The 78th Psalm is our text today as we are continuing our Building a House of Faith series. By the way, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 578, and you will find our text for the day. 578 is the page. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want to read one, then uh, you're welcome to take one of these with you. It is our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, I mentioned that uh, this month we've been in a series called Building a House of Faith, and we've looked at different rooms in our house, talking about how they relate to our lives and our families. We started off looking at the living room, talked about how that was that uh, perfect picture of a room that no one ever actually used, and, and you couldn't sit on the furniture, and we talked about the importance for authenticity in our life. And then we talked about the kitchen and, and how we're to feed our souls and feed our families that, that spiritual life and a spiritual food and how we're to protect ourselves and our families from the poison of the world that wants to corrupt and kill. Uh, last week we talked about the bedroom. And uh, while it was a little bit awkward and uncomfortable for some of us, uh, it, we talked about God's plan for intimacy, that he created sex to bless us. Satan corrupts God's gifts uh, and, and tries to destroy us. And we talked about how to build that healthy love relationship with our spouse. And today we're talking about the family room. And, and as we talk about this, how many of you have noticed that architecture of houses has changed dramatically through the years? It, you know, it's, it used to be that there was that, you know, living room and then uh how many of you grew up with a family room or a den kind of room in your house you know that that room that was comfortable you know they had the recliners and the couches that you could actually sit on and use and and you could eat in there right anyone remember tv trays yeah you still you grew up on eating tv dv dinners on tv trays it was awesome right and we and we all gathered there as the family because it was the family room and that's where the giant 19 inch tv was Right? And, and you had four or maybe five channels if you counted PBS. Uh, and, and you got up to change the channel. Click, click, click. And everybody watched the same shows because there were only five channels. And everybody knew when the shows were on that they were going to watch. TV Guide was memorized. And, and it was just like, you know, that was the family room. We all gathered. And it was comfortable. And we did life together in our family room. And, and, and maybe if you're really blessed, you went beyond a family room, you had a rec room. Anybody have a rec room in their house growing up? Like two people. <laughs> wow. Well, we had a rec room once in one of our 15 houses that I lived in growing up. Uh, we had a rec room. It was in the basement, and, and we finished the basement out, and, and it had a pool table, it had a dartboard, it had a record player. Okay, for those of you under 40, Google it, Okay. We played these giant CDs called LPs and uh, our albums, and they were really cool. But uh, it was interesting is that my parents never used that rec room. They, they provided it, but they never participated. Uh, really, we didn't do fun together as a family. Uh, my parents knew how to work, uh, not play. They considered play a waste of time. Uh, and, and as sometimes I tell people, my, my parents were fun averse and humor challenged. Uh, and, but they took us to church. And church, by the way, was not fun either. It was serious. If you had fun at church, you usually got in trouble when you got home. Uh, but the great thing my parents did is they passed on their faith to me. And that's what we want to do. We want to pass on our faith to the next generation. Psalm 78, verse 4, says, We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. If you have a version app that you're reading the, uh, the Bible in or doing our, following along our notes with, uh, flip over to the message version of the Bible. Here's what the message version puts that verse. We're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it along to the next generation. God's fame and fortune, the marvelous things that he has done. Isn't that a beautiful picture? We don't want to keep it to ourselves. We want to pass it on to that next generation. The great things that God has done in our lives and in our midst. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, 
and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life, then you probably desperately want your children and your grandchildren to have a living, breathing faith in Jesus. Right? <laughs> I'll try that again. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you probably desperately want your children and your grandchildren to know Jesus, right? Okay, well, I'm just making sure because I was assuming that. And, and we weren't really sure there. We were kind of like quiet about it. So we want our kids to know Jesus, but here's the, the thing, sad thing. Statistically, it's not working. About 70% of the uh, teens who attended church regularly for at least one year of high school dropped out as college students and young adults. They quit going to church. Now, a slight majority returned to church eventually, much later. Um, but I'm just going to be honest with you. We want to do so much better. We want to pass on that faith to the next generation. And, and I know that some of you were those, um, you know, faith dropouts for a season. You know, it might have been, you know, a season that lasted a decade or two or, you know, more. But uh, you experienced that. You know what it was to, lose, to kind of let that faith go and then come back to it. Uh, I know some of you right now are praying for adult children who have wandered far from God and you desperately want them to have that relationship with Jesus. And, and I know that some of you are in the midst of raising children and grandchildren and you want them to become people of faith committed to following Jesus. Uh, let me just share with you two of the huge factors in passing faith on to the next generation. If we want our kids to own their faith and it to be real and lasting, here are the two indications that are, the, I guess, the two biggest factors that contribute to kids sticking with faith. Uh, the first factor is this, and it may surprise you. Kids hold on to their faith uh, as they grow up when they've had meaningful relationships with adults in church that aren't only their parents. Meaningful adult relationships in church with other people of faith. And they get to see that faith lived out. In other words, we're talking about people who volunteer to work with our students and who work with our Calvary kids on a regular basis. It's those people who, who create those meaningful relationships with our teens and with our kids that, that influence them to stick with their faith. And, and I just want you to know that if you're one of those volunteers, you make a tremendous difference if you care about the spiritual life of teens or children. And some of you are hearing that, and you're going, yeah, uh, I want to thank those workers for doing that. And that's what you should do. When you walk out of here, you see somebody wearing one of the Calvary Kids shirts, or you see somebody who works with Calvary students, thank them for investing in our teenagers. But don't stop there. Volunteer. Volunteer. Be a difference maker in this world. And I know some of you are like, I'm too old. You're not too old. Now, you might be too grumpy, or you might be too boring, <laughs> but you're not too old. I want you to think about this. Some of you are praying for your grandkids and that, that they will find a church and that somebody will invest in them and introduce them to Jesus. Why don't you become somebody else's answer to prayer? Why, why don't you step into that place because somebody else's grandkids are attending here and their grandparents are praying for them that someone will invest in them and introduce them to Jesus and love them and, and pour faith into them. And it's something that's so easy that you can do if you want to make a difference in the lives of teenagers and kids. And you do because you want your kids and your grandkids to come to that place of owning their faith. The second factor that influences kids to hang on to their faith is being raised by parents whose faith is alive and active and real. And that's what I want to focus on today. How to be a family that passes on our faith to the next generation. And what I'm going to share is not foolproof. It's not a promise but they're principles of family life that will pay eternal dividends. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to be a family that... Uh, I'm going to pause right there, because before I dive into these simple principles, uh, I just realize that every family makes choices. Every one of our families has priorities. We make decisions. And so parents, you, you know, you, you kind of make decisions, and those decisions have consequences for your family. And, and here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want to challenge you to listen and evaluate. In other words, I'm not prescribing what you ought to do, but I'm, I'm going to challenge you to listen and evaluate your priorities as a family. And if, what if I, and if what I share makes sense, then you may want to alter how you focus your time or your energy or your money. So here we go. Be a family 
that plays together. If you want to pass on your faith to the next generation, be a family that plays together. Uh, play games. Play board games. Play video games that are age-appropriate. Uh, I remember when uh, the Wii's came out, and, and we got one as a family. Uh, you guys, anyone ever play the Wii? You know, and Wii Tennis, you know, it's so cool. Make sure you put the strap on, otherwise you're going to break your TV. But, um, but you're playing Wii Tennis, and, and my wife and I, we're like doing the whole run around the living room, you know, like reaching, you know, that kind of stuff. And one of my youngest daughter is sitting on the couch moving about this much and beating the pants off of us. <laughs> and, you know, it's hilarious. But, but, you know, unplug and do family game nights, you know, and start early when they're, when they're little. Just go, hey, we're going to do family game night together. And, uh, and I just want you to know that uh, I used to dominate at Pretty Pretty Princess. <laughs> I have girls. So, you know, we had, you know, games for little girls. And so, you know, I'd get that jewelry and I'd get that crown. And I own that crown. <laughs> so play together. Go on the boat. Teach them how to ski. Teach them how to water ski. Teach them how to fish or shoot or ride bikes or ride quads or ride horses or hike or travel. Have fun together. Real fun, not Facebook fun. Don't, don't do things so you can stage your family for photos for Facebook. Okay? Remember the first time I saw this, long before Facebook existed. Uh, in fact, Merelda and I were, were just a young couple, and we went to Disney World, and, and we're walking through, and we see this family coming off a ride, and, and literally a dad had a camcorder. Again, if you're under 40, Google it. And, uh, you know, and he's taking it, he's like, go back up the ride and come back off again so I get your faces and be happy this time. And I just nudged her and I said, I will never be that dad. I don't want to be that guy. Don't, don't just stage photos so that you look like you're having fun. Actually have fun. You know, belly laughing joy kind of fun. And some of you are wondering, what does this have to do with God? I mean, what does this have to do with But really, we came to church, here's some spiritual advice, and you're talking about play. Come on, preacher, get serious. What, 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 what does this have to do with anything spiritual? I can answer that. Two words. They happen to be biblical. You can find them in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, where it says, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Here, say it with me. Rejoice always. See, look at that. You guys say you can't learn Scripture. And there you just did. You memorized it. You got one down. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, if you want to, that's the hard part. And, and so, rejoice always. Look, uh, I already confess, my parents were kind of workaholics. Okay. They, they love to work. My mom still loves to work. Uh, many of my childhood memories are about working as a family. Uh, me trying to get out of work. Uh, me trying to turn work into a game and then getting into trouble for goofing off. Uh, but as I wrote this, I actually realized I don't really have any family play memories. Uh, we didn't play together as a family. Now, as kids, we played, uh, but... Uh, but I don't have those all together kind of memories. So there's very little family joy, and, and honestly, there's very little church joy. And then, because God has a sense of humor, he put me in charge of a church. And, and we make no apologies about celebrating or laughing or having fun at all, because if you actually read the Bible that we will offer to give you, you will discover that one of the byproducts of having the Holy Spirit in your life and controlling your life is joy. God is actually building joy in us. It's a sign of spiritual maturity, not immaturity. It's not a sign that you're goofing off spiritually. It's a sign that you understand how God made us and wired us, and we can laugh, and we can play, and we can celebrate, because Jesus is alive. So, uh, as a family, play together. And parents, don't just be a chauffeur or a spectator of your kids' events. Engage in activity with them. Participate. Moms, don't get so distracted by cooking, cleaning, laundry, making sure the house looks good, that you ignore your children. It's about priorities. Dads, don't be too busy for your children. Please. Recognize that the most important uh, responsibility that God has given you is to raise your sons and daughters. Don't ignore them. Uh, I grew up in the 70s, and so in the 70s, there was this hugely popular song that rebuked uh, every dad of that generation. It, it was called Cats in the Cradle by a guy named uh, Harry Chapin. Uh, everyone under 40, go home and YouTube it. Uh, it's there. I checked it out. You can find it. 
uh, listen to it, you'll understand what we're talking about because it may smack you too. But, uh, but it's about recognizing that the moments are brief and we miss them. We miss them. So play together. If you want to pass on your faith to the next generation, be a family that plays together and be a family that serves together. Serves together. Uh, if, if you're around Calvary at all, then you know that Jesus taught that serving is the path to greatness. In, in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And, and we all want our kids to be great. We all have dreams of greatness for our kids, but here's the thing. The path to greatness is through serving. And, and if we want our children to own their faith, then we need to teach them to serve others. And guess what? You cannot teach serving by talking about it. It doesn't happen. You teach serving by serving. <laughs> Not a lot of you really understood that because only about four people answered. But you, if you want to teach serving, then you've got to actually serve. And, and one of the great gifts that my parents imparted to me was the example of serving others. I mean, they served people through the church and outside the church. And since I was their child, the forced labor of serving others was thrust upon me. And I learned the joy in serving Christ. And then as a teenager, my youth group started taking mission trips. And we'd go and serve other people for weeks at a time. And, and, and God began to show me how much joy there was in serving. And, and simply put, if you want responsible, respectful kids, involve them in serving others. Involve them in serving others. Uh, if you prefer entitled, selfish children, don't. And because we believe in this, as a church, we provide opportunities for families to serve. Many of those are opportunities to serve together. So let me just mention a couple of these because uh, this is a real practical point. Uh, first of all, October the 7th is our Serve Our Schools Day for our community. Calvary is leading Lake Havasu City community to invest in our schools to bless our kids, make our schools better. And we've got 100 projects. We're hoping and praying for 1,000 volunteers. And I committed Calvary to 50 projects and 500 volunteers. And, and, and maybe that was crazy, but I believe that we can do it if we value serving. And, and here's the thing. You can go online at calvarylhc.com, and you can look at the projects, and maybe you can find one at your kid's school or, or somebody, a friend of yours uh, who teaches at a school, and you can say, hey, we're going to go and invest in that school, and let's pick a project as a family or a couple of families. Or maybe you want to get together with your life group and say, hey, our life group uh, is going to do a project. Let's get together and let's do that, and let's take our, our families along. Or maybe you're a part of a, a car club or a civic organization. You say, hey, let's, get, let's rally some families there and let's take on a project or two projects and let's do those and get them done. But we have to, you know, it's a great opportunity to serve together. And if you have kids at home, it's a great opportunity for you to get them involved in serving their school, their classmates, their teachers. Here's the catch. That's the first Saturday of spring break, or fall break, not spring break, fall break. And I realize that's everybody's annual pilgrimage to Disneyland Day. And so here's the real challenge. Put off your Disneyland trip by a day or go the second weekend of fall break and, and make it a priority and use that to teach your kids. You see, these are life lessons. Are we going to step up and are we going to serve our schools? We offer other opportunities. Peach Springs Mission Days. Go and serve others as a family. We have mission trips. A family trip to Idaho. Uh, our Calvary students going to Hawaii. We have trips planned for Thailand and Greece next year. And, and I just want to know what you guys know as a parent. I took my kids to Disneyland. I took my kids to Magic Mountain. We went to national parks, but we also went on mission trips. I took my kids to Mexico, to Nigeria, to Greece, to China. And, and, and yeah, it was expensive. And yes, we had to plan for it. And it was about priorities and values, but it was life-changing opportunities in those moments. Parents, uh, put that on your list to do as a family. Grandparents, decide you're going to take your grandkids on one of those trips. Invest in their lives. We go beyond that. Why don't you sign up as a family for the First Impressions team? Be greeters together at the doors. At, not just as individuals, but as families. Work together. Or maybe as a family, if your kids are old enough, you sign up to work in the early childhood wing. Once a month, hey, come to the service at 9.30 and then 11, go and serve in the, the early childhood wing. 
as a family. It's a value. You teach them to, to serve. Or, or just look for other opportunities. You know, maybe it's working with the homeless or, or the food bank or visiting nursing homes. Or maybe you just stay late after a service and pick up communion cups. See, the opportunities are all around us. And if you really want to pass on your faith, then serve together as a family. And then be a family that worships together. Is worship a priority for you? Because, I, I mean, I know you're here, and I appreciate the fact that you're here, and I praise God for you. But is worship a priority for your family, or do you let any little thing interrupt being here on weekends? I mean, it's not like, you know, it's different. we got four service options, so you can come all different kinds of times. But, see, here's what's happening. Your children are watching and learning if God deserves a priority place in your life. They're paying attention to how you value, how you prioritize time and energy and where you show up. And by the way, because we want you to worship together, that's why we do family worship services. That's why we have things like family camp, which is coming up in September, so that you can worship together. That's why we encourage you know, parents to volunteer to serve in Calvary kids or Calvary students so you can worship together in those environments with your kids in their style. But it goes way beyond the weekends. Parents, do you pray with your children? Do you pray with, you know, together as a family? Do you, do you involve yourselves in that time? Uh, you know, and maybe it's mealtime. You go, yeah, we pray for the food, but expand that and pray for one another and, and, and pray for the needs in, in the world and in your life. Do you have that time? Do you, as a family, do you talk about Jesus? I mean, really, do you just have those conversations about God in your family? When you see the, the sunset, you say, hey, look at that. Isn't it God amazing how he paints the sky? Isn't that beautiful? When you're enjoying the day on the lake, do you point out God's creation and, and the beauty that surrounds you? You know, are you, are you bringing Jesus into the conversation? By the way, if you don't know how to do that, and you're like, oh, I'd be really awkward, I don't know where to start, then, and you've got kids in the, in, involved in our Calvary Kids, they actually have cheat sheets for parents to tell you how to have conversations with your kids about what they're learning. And the kids actually expect you to ask them, hey, what did you learn today? And, and you talk about this, and it's got Bible passages. You, if you don't know the stories, because I know some of you don't, look them up. Read them. You can even read them in advance and then talk to your kids about them. But you can read them together. Well, you know, what music do you play when you guys are traveling? Whether it's taking them to school or, or someplace else, is it just, you know, what you like? Or do you say, hey, you know, I'll play whatever Christian songs you want to listen to. You know, when our kids were little, we just bought, you know, all these kid Christian, you know, CDs and we played them to death. I can still sing some of those, you know, kids songs because uh, I heard them over and over and over and over. You see, are you leading your family to know and celebrate Jesus? Because what we do matters. And, and how we live is significant. And we can choose whether or not we will pass on our faith to the next generation. And my prayer is that you will. My prayer is that you will build memories of faith with your children and your grandchildren. So I want to close with a challenge. And this is incredibly practical and maybe a little bit difficult. But uh, I just want to close with this challenge. If you've got kids at home... I want to challenge you that today you'll go home with your kids, and yes, you'll talk about what they learned and things like that. Or if they're older, you'll talk about what they heard in the sermon. But then as parents, you'll tell your children how you came to faith, how Jesus became important to you. Who were those people that invested in you spiritually? Who were those people that, that taught you to love Jesus and to follow Jesus? Because we want our kids to know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus and serve Jesus. Share that with them. And let, and let them ask you questions about what it was like growing up as, as, you know, as a person of faith or, or what it was like growing up without faith and, and all the differences. And explain to them how you really hope and pray for them that they will believe and own it. In other words, invite Jesus into the conversation in your family. And, and if your kids aren't at home any longer... I realized as I wrote this and as I preached this that this was maybe a, a difficult sermon for some people to hear. 
Because some of you are in this room and your kids are grown and you realize um, that you were not the parent who passed on your faith to that generation. And, and you're feeling the, the regrets of missed opportunities, maybe a little bit of guilt, because by the way, that parent guilt is just universal. You're not the only one. Hey, by the way, just for the record, every parent feels guilty about not being the perfect parent. Okay, you guys with me there? Okay, yeah. See, we're all, and by the way, we're sinners, so we're all screw-up parents, okay? Just realize that. Every one of us, we, we want to bless our kids, but all of us curse our kids in some way or another. And, and that's just reality. And, and so if you're sitting here and you're going, yeah, I wish I'd heard this sermon 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, you probably did. You just ignored it. Uh, the, uh, if you're wishing you'd heard this sermon a long time ago and, and had raised your kids differently, I want you to understand that God redeems. First of all, his grace abounds to all of us, no matter how we parented or how we're parenting. Uh, and that's the good news. And, and here's the other thing. God redeems by our choices of obedience now. And so if, if your kids are grown and they're far from God and you don't feel like you passed on your faith to them in the way that you want, or maybe you didn't have faith then and you came to faith later and, and you wish you'd met Jesus earlier, then, then here's what I want to challenge you to do. Um, I'm going to challenge you, whether it's by a phone call or, you know, having coffee or, or writing an email, I want to challenge you to communicate to them just really simply, hey, I'm sorry that uh, I, I, I let you down in this area. It, you, by the way, if you say you're sorry to your kids for the ways that you screwed them up, it really goes a long way to healing. Because there's some of you I know as parents who never said you're sorry because your parents never said sorry to you. Go ahead and break that curse now. And, and just say, hey, I, I'm sorry that, uh, that I didn't pass on my faith to you. And then explain. Don't defend. Just then, then explain. Jesus has really become important in my life. He's changed my life. He's made my life better. Uh, I know I'm forgiven. I know I'm loved. And, and I really believe that Jesus would make your life better too. And then stop right there and just say, love you, mom, dad whatever they call you. You see, that'll open up that, that opportunity for God to redeem and restore and heal and, and, and influence. Because what you're saying is, this is my story, and, and I wish that you had this story. And I wish that, that you could experience some of this the way that, that I know it now. And you're not being pushy, and you're not being preachy, and you're not being demanding, especially if you start off with that whole apology thing. And maybe God will use that to prompt some changes, to be the catalyst in the life uh, of your son or daughter or your grandkids to begin redeeming their lives. And, and that's just something tangible that you could do. Something that's tangible beyond that, especially if your kids are involved in a church someplace, and uh, whether nominally or actively, and, and just simply let them know, hey, by the way, if uh, my grandson or my granddaughter wants to go to camp, I'll pay for it. I don't want that to be an obstacle. Hey, if my, if my grandkids want to go on a mission trip, I'll sponsor them. If they don't want to go on a mission trip, I'll take them on one. If you don't trust me enough to take your kids on a trip, then I'll send you guys both on one. You know, we'll go as a family. Hey, in other words, remove the obstacles that get in the way of people investing in their kids spiritually. We can do that. And as we take those tangible, practical, honest steps of faith, it's amazing how God begins to restore and redeem and build our families. So in whatever ways you can, build memories of faith with your children and your grandchildren. After all, it's your faith, and they're your kids, and it's your choice. Me, I want to pass my faith on to the next generation I want them to know God's fame and fortune and the marvelous things that he has done. Will you pray with me?